Well, thank you, Yolanda. It's always a pleasure uh, to chat with you and to uh, to do anything with uh, with Neo 4 J. Just uh, just love the tech, love the uh, the folks there. So let me go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for everyone uh, attending. So hello there. Uh, let's get functional. I, as I like to say, pull off a trifecta. Uh, with Spring Cloud Function, Azure Functions, and Neo4j. Uh, again, my name is Mark Heckler. I'm a principal cloud advocate of Java and JVM languages uh, with Microsoft. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end, but time is so short. Uh, and if you're like me, you think of the best questions or comments or feedback after the fact anyway. So please do reach out to me. Email works. Twitter is better. Uh, I'm also on Mastodon as well, but uh, Twitter is kind of an ideal jumping off point. Uh, so let's, uh, I guess, start there for now. Um, a bit about me, I am an architect and developer uh, by background, also an advocate, uh, as um, uh, was mentioned earlier. Um, advocacy allows me to do two of the things that I love the most, talk and code, and do it at the same time, which is <laughs> always a treat. Uh, I am an author, a book author. I am a Java champion, Java 1 rockstar, groundbreaker ambassador, Kotlin developer expert, and licensed instrument rated pilot, uh, which gives me a little bit of a chance to see the world from a little different perspective, you know, um, several thousand feet in the air, because again, as you asked, it's feet. Uh, but anyway, uh, feet meters, it's all distance, right? So it gives you a little different perspective, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, again, I, I actually had co-authored a couple of books with good friends of mine, loved it, had a great time doing it, but realized very quickly how much work was involved, even as a co-author. Uh, so I swore I would never write a book by myself, but questions kept coming up uh, in my work as well as, you know, when I would we'd be speaking at different places with different folks. Uh, and I just felt like maybe I could contribute to the conversation. So uh, when the pandemic hit, I thought, well, I'm home anyway. Why not write a book? Uh, so this is out there. Uh, if you're interested in checking it out, I uh, put all the code out there in uh, in Java and Kotlin. I'm actually borrowing a piece of that just for a data feed today. Uh, but uh, if you're interested in finding out more, you can uh, follow the book on Twitter or access the uh, site listed and get a free trial to O'Reilly Safari Books Online if you want to just check it out, if you want to buy it. If you don't, it's all good. Uh, so the plan for the day, uh, I love a good quote, and Leonard Bernstein, the uh, former uh, conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra, once said, to achieve great things, two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. And I think we have both of those today. Uh, again, time is short uh, here together, but uh, we have a lot of time afterward to continue the conversation. So I, my purpose today is to start the conversation and we can carry it on as long as we would like or need to. So a quick overview of what we're going to be covering today. Uh, first, a, a question that is very common is when to app and when to function. And one thing about our industry, about the technical field, is that in many cases, we actually don't start with the question. We start with a solution, and then we vigorously apply that solution to every problem domain that we run across, which is probably a terrible way of going about things in many ways. However, it does have the advantage of uh, very quickly sifting out, filtering out what is uh, the appropriate problem domain to apply said solution to. So uh, in, in many cases, we we get a shiny new tool and we, we start pounding on everything like it's a nail, right? This looks like a hammer, everything must be a nail. Uh, and, and over time, we figure out that some things are nails and some things just really aren't. And, and that's kind of what maybe we'll discuss a bit uh, before we start off. I think we do make that a little bit harder than it has to be, at least in the general sense. Uh, as, as we'll discuss momentarily. Uh, then we'll talk about why Spring Cloud Function, why Azure Functions, why Neo4j, and then we'll just dive into the code because most of us, uh, I'm, I'm pretty confident, live in the code. Uh, so it's good to understand and establish context, but then it's good to actually see things in uh, as they unfold. So that's where we'll spend most of our time today together. <coughs> Pardon me. So here is the simple version of the, the flowchart, if you will. Uh, notice the bottom center, some caveats apply. This doesn't mean you can shut off your brain and blindly use this. It's very simplistic and simple flowchart. It doesn't cover all uh, exigencies and, and outcomes possible, use cases, edge cases. But what it does do is give you, a, I feel like, a very good starting point. And from there, of course, you have to apply uh, your wisdom, your understanding, your experience and expertise to determine if something falls outside of that more common path, right? Uh, so typically, I look at a piece of functionality, and I, I consider a couple things primarily, and then branch out from there. Uh, is there a low time between calls? Meaning, if you're spending most of your time making those calls, and, and in any in any time period, let's say 24 hours, because it's easy, it's a day, uh, if you're spending most of your time making calls, and there's very little time in between those calls, 
chances are that should probably be an app. Uh, also, and kind of a corollary of that, if you will, is if these these bits of functionality are, are long running. So if you make a call and you want to accomplish something and it takes three minutes or 30 minutes to do so, uh, and, and you spend a lot of time in execution, um, chances are that you might want to make that an app as well. If you combine those two and you have very low time between calls and they're very long running, it's obvious that that in most cases, again, I, I don't want to ever say 100% because there are, again, there are edge cases in every potential circumstance. But in most cases, that tends to lean heavily toward the app. If you're calling something sporadically, if there is a long time between calls, if it's called infrequently, that's really kind of the ideal use case for a function. And, and with in terms of the, the function versus app debate, uh, many times you're looking at, at cost factors as well, uh, resource factors. Uh, but, but that's just kind of that rule of thumb that you start with. Now, again, no rule, that's why they call it a rule of thumb, right? It's not 100% applied to every circumstance. But this is, a, I feel like, an excellent starting point. And then from there, when you're dealing with something that doesn't fall uh, within, neatly within that uh, 80 to 90% of cases that you can uh, quickly sift through that way, uh, that's when you apply the extra uh, vigor and, and, and rigor and look at uh, uh, ways to, to determine whether it should be a function or an app. So diving right into why. Why Spring Cloud Function? Why Azure Functions? Why Neo4j? Well, uh, I'm going to hit this fairly quickly too, but I do want to give it a little bit of um, examination uh, individually and, and in a combined fashion. So Spring Cloud Function is, is a very, well, it's a Spring project, right? So uh, it obviously allows you to leverage the, the capabilities of different Spring projects under the Spring umbrella. So things like Spring Data, Spring Cloud Stream, uh, and various things like that, uh, Webflux, if you if you choose, um, and Spring Cloud Function is in and of itself based on uh, Java functions. So it's it's very close to the bare metal if you consider Java functions bare metal. In in this context, we do right uh, because it at its purest in its purest form, it's just taking one thing and doing some kind of a transformation and then providing that other thing that comes out the other end. And that's all that Spring Cloud Function does other than it allows you to leverage things like auto configuration uh, and, and other uh, spring projects that allow you to, again, focus on what you need to do first, uh, increase that developer experience and give you extra superpowers uh, without going through a lot of uh, boilerplate and, and um, uh, things that slow you down in terms of your velocity to deliver to production. So Spring Cloud Function is an excellent starting point. Uh, Spring Cloud Function, obviously, anything you develop using Spring Cloud Function has to be deployed somewhere. Uh, I actually, uh, Azure Functions is a very uh, powerful uh, capability, a very powerful deployment model within the Azure ecosystem. And uh, folks who are, are have made the strategic choice or, or one of their choices to deploy to Microsoft Azure platforms uh, can leverage the power of Azure Functions very easily in combination with or, or without Spring Cloud Function, but they, they work extremely well together, as you'll see here, hopefully, momentarily. Neo4j gives you that, the power of the graph, right? And I don't think I probably necessarily need to expand on that a whole lot because we're here at nodes, right? But, uh, but Neo4j allows you to, to get the power not only of the the entity, the node, but also the relationships among them. So uh, this makes for a very uh, clean way to leverage the power of the graph, even if you're breaking things out at a lower level, more granular function level. Hopefully we'll be able to communicate at least a little bit of that today and start the conversation. And again, uh, happy to expand on that later when we have uh, more time after the fact. But with that, let's dive into the code because I don't want to, to lose a lot of our time uh, you know, once we establish a context, it's good, again, to see it in action. And that's where I, uh, where I like to live anyway. So uh, I'm going to go to the Spring Initializer. And I guess to give you a little bit of, a, uh, of context in terms of what I have running, and I'll show you a little bit more about that later on, but I, I am using live data. And the live data that I'm using is a feed of aircraft that are in my particular area at this point in time. Uh, so I have a small device running on our home network uh, called a plane finder. And you can get one of these and set up and, and, and log anything that's within range using an antenna and you know, the, the proper uh, protocols, et cetera. And, and I use that to feed a global model. So it gives you a kind of a picture of the global air traffic at any given point in time. Uh, but even if you don't run it with that, if, even if you don't have one, uh, in, in my feeder application, I generate some sample data. So if you don't have that and want to run this app, it still works. 
Uh, and again, I pulled that from my book. It's a nice little uh, application that feeds data. So I can use that in my presentations because live data is better than generated data. It's certainly more interesting, I think. Uh, and then I actually have uh, the use case that that feeds because what it'll do is pull from any plane that's within our area, within about 200 miles of, of where it's located. And it feeds, it, it'll grab aircraft positions, which include information about that particular aircraft, its transponder hex code or hexadecimal code. Uh, and then it also gets the aircraft registration number. Uh, here it's with the Federal Aviation uh, Administration. Uh, so FAA uh, tail number, they call it. Uh, that's the number that identifies the aircraft. And then it also pulls in the... Um, the type of aircraft. And sometimes not all those fields are there, but certainly the transponder code is there, uh, the transponder registry number. And then you have the position, the exact position at that point in time. So of course, this makes a lot of sense in many ways. If we were going to be pulling this regularly and tracking this like consistently 24 seven, 365, you'd probably want apps. But what I wanted to do is create a scenario where we could do this dynamically, just when we wanted to, sporadically. And that makes perfect sense to have functions that we can use that to, to fire up a function and save the, the aircraft information as well as the position information. And then perhaps go back and do some analysis on that later. That's still in progress, but we, we've got the functions in place. So I have a position function that's already written and running. And I'm using a, a local version of Azure Functions to do that. I have the feeder application, which is just a Spring Boot application that's pulling this device on my network. And then we're going to together build our aircraft uh, aircraft uh, function, and we're going to work through that. And I'm gonna show you kind of my, uh, very much abbreviated, but my, my workflow and how I develop functions. Uh, again, I'm abbreviating this because we have a, such a short amount of time, but I'm gonna show you kind of the, the distilled version. And I think it's incredibly useful to see how all these things work together and come together to allow you to develop functions quickly to leverage the power of Azure Functions, Spring Cloud Functions, and Neo4j. So I'm going to just change a little bit of the project metadata, create this at theheckers.com. I'm going to create something I'm going to call aircraft function, and we'll call this our aircraft function. And then I'm going to use Java 17, jar packaging, and then let's add some dependencies. First, I want to add the Spring Cloud function dependency. I'm also going to, of course, add in Neo4j, and then I'm going to add in Lombok. Now, you don't have to use Lombok. You can just generate your, your domain class. You can use records. I'm going to use Lombok because I use it for a few other things as well, so might as well. Uh, but I'm going to save this down here on my desktop, and we'll open our project, and we'll get started with that. There it is. Okay, so desktop, and let's open that in IntelliJ. Now, I know I work for Microsoft. You probably expected me to use VS Code. I love VS Code. I use it uh, probably almost 50% of the time, but many cases I still use IntelliJ. I love IntelliJ. Uh, it's a great IDE and use what works, right? So, um, so let's start off here. I'm going to just open our palm and we see that we've got, as we would expect, a few things in here. Now, I'm going to add one more thing because I have Spring Cloud Function context, but what I want to do at this point is to be able to uh, have this execute and, and hold open, uh, in this case, a, a Tomcat uh, instance, so I can uh, use this to respond, well, get requests and respond via HTTP. So uh, not required in certain cases, in other cases, but in this case, the well, I'm going to be using, I'm going to add this in so I can use that. The next thing I'm going to do is go to the application properties and just set my server port to 7071 for a couple of reasons. One, I already have one application running on the default of 8080, so we don't want port conflicts. And two, because when I switch this over to uh, Azure Functions, Microsoft uh, Azure Functions, uh, it defaults to when you're running it locally, port 7071. So it just makes an easier transition for me down the road, but that's configurable as well. So the next thing I'm going to do is just start off with our domain. And I'm going to create a domain class here called aircraft. Uh, and I'm again, again, once uh, I'm going to use Lombok to make this a data class and then have Lombok provide a constructor with a uh, parameter for each of the member variables that's indicated uh, that is required, that it must be non-null. So I'll have things uh, like our string ADS hex, which is again, the transponder hexadecimal code. Uh, and then I'll have, uh, let's see, the registration, aircraft registration and their aircraft type. 
And of course, at some point, and not just yet, but what I'm going to do is make this a node, right? Uh, we'll get to that. I'm going to go ahead and put this in here now just in the interest of time. And I want to uh, make this a generated value. So Neo4j will uh, dutifully provide that for me. And then I want to make this a private uh, long ID. So that's our, our node ID, if you will. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is go back here and start off with providing a bean. And this is what Spring Cloud Function relies upon, right? A function. I'm just going to receive an aircraft and turn back around and reply with an aircraft, respond. And this isn't really a transformation in this case. It's, it's more like an echo. Again, in the interest of time, this is going to be very simple. So I'm going to grab the aircraft and return the aircraft, right? And that's okay. I mean, typically you do some kind of a transformation. So you might do something like this, a dot get the hex, a dot get the reg, and a dot get the type. But regardless, this should work. So let's find out if this really works. And again, this is kind of the, the path I follow, greatly distilled. So I'm going to start this up. And once this is running, uh, we actually have uh, the other the application running here in the background screen. I have my uh, position function running here. And then let's go ahead and start this. And I will just use HTTP to hit the aircraft endpoint and see what's flying around in our area. Okay, so we have, we see that we have a response. And the way I've I've written this just for the ease uh, of demoing is that uh, it prints out everything, it show, logs everything that it has, and then it shows any aircraft response I get back from the aircraft position or aircraft function. And then it shows the positions I get back from the position function. So if we go here and look on this side, well, I didn't log it, but we saw that it worked we, <laughs> because it returned the value properly. And that's one way to get started very quickly with Spring Cloud Function. Now, that's uh, one mechanism you can use. What I also can use is uh, for Spring Cloud Function, another way to do that is to just create a component. So echo, I will just call it an echo class, right? And we're going to implement a function, again, accepting an aircraft, returning an aircraft, right? Uh, we're going to make this a component. So again, uh, this is a bean. Uh, and since we have the code, it makes sense to, to define it as such, right? And it's telling us that we must declare uh, this abstract or implement an abstract method. And we certainly want to do that. So I'm going to implement the apply method. And then we'll just do this. And actually, I need to change this really quickly. And of course, we can do this. There we go. Uh, return new. There we go. Sometimes I get ahead of myself. And that should work equally well. So let's go ahead and do that. And actually, before I do that, what I'm going to do is uh, just uh, make a few changes here. So aircraft. That way we can see what's going on. Return aircraft. It's always nice to get a little more visibility into what's happening. So I'll restart that. All right, that's up and running. Let's go ahead and try that again. We see that it works again, and we see that we're getting back something now. We're, we're showing what we're actually uh, doing before we send it back, I should say. And then, of course, if you check here, we can verify that, yes, indeed, we're getting back the aircraft in the area and the positions that they're reporting. So that's all good. So far, we've gotten Spring Cloud Function up and running with very little effort, right? I mean, this has been pretty painless. Uh, now, what do we do to actually get those values saved? I'm already saving the position information, but what I really want to do is save it all so I can associate it and get some insights into the relationship and what happens over time with a particular aircraft. So what I'm going to do now is just add our repository or define our repository. We'll call this our aircraft repository, repository. And this will be an interface. And, yeah, well, let's see if I can uh, change that. Because I just noticed, oops, wrong, wrong ones. Okay, so I'm going to just uh, do this, refactor, rename. Typos are a bad thing. Refactor, there we go. And I'm going to extend our Neo4j repository, we're going to be storing type objects of type aircraft with IDs of type long. 
Uh, and then, of course, if we go back to our aircraft, we want to make this a node, right? So we uncomment that. And then we uncomment these two lines. And we import that. That is a Neo4j uh, ID. And of course, we want to do the generator value the same way. And then if we go to our echo function, what I want to do here is just inject our aircraft repository. And once again, since I'm using Lombok, I can do this and just uh, have Lombok provide a constructor uh, that incorporates a, a parameter for each member variable. In this case, it's just one, so all args. And that gets us what we need here. We can just do a repo.save of our aircraft. And voila, we're we're up and running, right? Or should be. Let's let's find out. So I'm going to save this. And since we're actually, I, what I need to do to in, in order to access uh, Neo4j or a DB is I have some environment variables set. So I'm going to run this from the command line at this point. So let me go into that. And then if I do a Maven spring boot run, you can see that this is very developer friendly. I mean, everything I've done has been super simple to do. I, I know I'm going at a kind of a fast clip because of our limited time, but it's pretty simple. And once you get into a routine of this, even doing it all manually like I am here is, is fairly easily done. So I'm going to go ahead here and we'll access this one more time. We see that, uh, oh, we have an ID, which is null. Oh, that's because I'm, no, I actually am getting that back. So let's see. Oh, I'm printing it out before I get that back. Ha, never mind. Okay, so that's uh, that's why, because I'm actually printing it before I get that uh, back from being saved. But if I go here, oh, I'm not returning that part. So yeah, so if we want to make that a little clearer, what I can do is uh, just do this. Um, yeah, let's let's do this. Let's just let's just uh, move this about here. Repo dot save this, and we'll introduce local variable there. Aircraft, um, aircraft. There we go. And then we'll print that out and we'll return aircraft. And it should work. All right. So let's try that again. Always good to see things live and in real time. We're up and running. And there we go. So everything works. And, and of course, we knew it would because things never fail in live demos. <laughs> okay, so so far we have Spring Cloud Function working and we have Neo4j, everything be, is being saved in Neo4j. So now how do we make that transition to our deployment environment? And that would be Azure Functions. And that's pretty simply done as well. I mean, Spring Cloud Function works brilliantly with it. Uh, that I need to do a few things to set it up first. Now, I could add in these things manually uh, to our POM file, but of course, our, our and that's a little tedious. That's not even really coding. Uh, <laughs> it's just YAML or excuse me, XML, right? So, which is similar to YAML, I guess, in in a ways. It's it's a lot of uh, brackets or braces, and uh, or should say, um, anyway, it's a lot of values here that we're we're uh, putting in an indenting. So what I'm going to do is cheat a little and copy paste that in. Uh, but what this involves is a few uh, parameters here that I'm adding, a few properties. Uh, and then uh, if I want to just verify everything is the way it should be, uh, I can do this and add that. And yeah, that all works. Uh, we know that we're going to be storing a few things here in source main Azure for our properties. Uh, so we also have uh, things like where what are plugins we need to add in order to deploy this uh, locally to a, a local instance uh, running Azure functions or deployed to Azure for real uh, in the cloud to run. Uh, so there are a few things that we have here, but we've got the uh, the, the build file set up now with the uh, additional uh, dependency and the additional plugin information. The dependency is is literally just this: the Azure Functions, uh, uh, sorry, the um, uh, the Spring Cloud Function adapter for Azure. So what I'm going to do now is just create a couple of uh, property files, and these aren't well. In in one case, there is some essential information there. Uh, but most of it is just optional information. It just cuts down the noise when you're running it and uh, adds to the um, uh, specificity, if you will. So I'm going to create a directory called Azure. 
I'm also going to create a file called host.json. And within that, uh, I'm just going to um, have the version here of our functions, which is 2.0. Again, that's the only value here. So that's not technically required, but it's again, very good to specify because uh, there are different versions you could potentially deploy to. And then I want to create another file called local.settings.json. And here I want to add just a couple of parameters. So is encrypted, uh, which I want this to be false because I want to be able to uh, access this uh, from anywhere by anyone in this particular limited set of circumstances. Uh, and then I want to provide some values. And the values are just the uh, runtime, which is Java, and then the main class. Uh, and, and what I want to do in this point, at this point, is just go to my application and grab the package right there, local and paste that and then go back once again and grab the application name and add that. And it's pretty simple in that regard. The next thing I want to do is create my function invoker. So I'm going to call this, so since we have an echo function, I'm just kind of going to call this the echo invoker. I'm then going to extend the function invoker class here. So we'll uh, receive aircraft, will supply aircraft. And part of what I want to show is the simplest way and some of the shortcuts uh, that make it a lot easier to get started. And one of the things that I can uh, show you that I think is kind of useful is this HTTP trigger. If I start to put this, this is not where you'd put it, but by simply typing it and then hitting B, you can drill in and see the hints that are provided by Oleg uh, Zurakowski and his, his crew. Oleg's a, a a good human being and uh, has documented this very nicely. So it seems a shame not to use it. So I'm going to uh, just paste this in and we'll make a few small changes and get up and running. So I'm going to change this to AC because this is our aircraft uh, function. And I'm just going to import all of the uh, unknowns here. I'm going to change this from returning a string to returning an HTTP uh, response message, response message. We'll just call this echo, echo it. Why not? And then what we have here is we're using an HTTP trigger since we're going to be using HTTP to uh, provide or, or to be able to listen to and respond. Uh, so there we go. There we go. And we're going to return an aircraft. I'm also going to include as a parameter here the execution context. And because we're going to use that as well. So the first thing I'm going to do is just create an aircraft. We'll call this again, cleverly enough aircraft. And I'm going to use the request coming in, get the body. I also want to filter this because occasionally there will be some bad data coming in. And if the uh, hex code is not equal, not equal to null, then it's good. Otherwise, if there's no correct body, if there's no ADS hex code, uh, what I want to do is just create a supplier to supply us a new aircraft just some dummy data, uh, and I'm going to provide a dummy hex code here. Uh, the registration number, we'll just make up 98765, and um, then we'll have a type of unknown, since we don't have any idea what possible kind of aircraft this is. And then I'm going to return, return the request. I'm going to use that to create a response builder uh, with an OK uh, response. Uh, and of course, I'm going to provide uh, the body, and I'm going to use the handle function or handle request function uh, method, I should say, that's defined within the function invoker itself. I'm going to provide it the aircraft. I'm going to provide it the context. And then I'm going to uh, supply a header. In this case, I want to specify a content type. And again, these are optional things, but I find them extremely useful and helpful within the context I'm developing. Um, and then application JSON type. And then let's build it. That, as they say, should be that. That's all that's really needed is this invoker so that Azure Functions knows what to invoke. And in this case, it's going to go ahead and invoke this function and it'll work the same way it has, uh, hopefully, uh, that's the plan anyway, the same way it has using Spring Cloud Stream. So I'm going to go out here now to our function. I'm going to uh, rebuild it, Maven clean package. We'll see if I have any errors. Of course not, right? No errors ever. And then I'm going to uh, 
have to try to be optimistic here. This is a live demo. And then I'm going to go ahead and do, well, so far so good. That's looking, looking positive, right? And then I'm going to Maven Azure Functions run. And this will take a moment. Uh, I'm running this locally. Of course, it's the same thing if you want to deploy. Instead of doing a Maven Azure Functions run, you do a Maven Azure Functions deploy. And based on the information that you've already specified in your POM, uh, it will deploy. So in this case, it would, uh, in my case, if I deployed uh, to, let's see, POM. Where did I lose my POM? There we go. If I deployed to Azure, it would use this resource group to place this function in, it would use the ac-fun as the function name. It would place this in the East US region. You always want to be closest to where it's going to be executed, right? In my case, that would be East US. Uh, and of course, you have uh, the information like the start class and so on and so forth. Now, I do want to show you, uh, while we have just a moment, uh, what's going on in front of this. So let me bring the application over that I'm using as a data feed. And I am just referencing uh, the local uh, the local device on my local network to grab the aircraft that's reporting a position at this point in time. And then I'm using uh, diff two different web client, Webflux, or excuse me, web clients, reactive web clients, to connect to these different functions running in different endpoints locally in this case. Uh, so I've got a position endpoint, a position client that's going to access our position function and our aircraft client that's going to access our aircraft function. And then each time I get a node, each time I get a position for an aircraft, I split that out. I post the aircraft uh, to NEO in an aircraft um, node, and then I post the position to a position node. So that's a, a very quick look at that. Uh, and of course, we should have this up and running, or nearly so by now. Uh, let's see. So yes, it is already up and running. So let's go ahead and try this. Everything is working fine. You can see that it's running Spring Cloud Function. It's going ahead and returning those as expected. So with that, uh, boy, our time is short. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, just to give you a quick look, if we go over here to Aura DB, actually I have this already open, assuming it didn't time out. And if I want to run this, we see that we now have 992 aircraft logged in there. It was 876. So we have uh, several aircraft flying over at this point in time. Good to log those, right? So with that, uh, again, time is short. Let me go ahead and wrap up. If you want to know more, uh, the, the actual meta repo is at Git Functional under my GitHub account, uh, github.com slash mkhack get functional. Uh, and that will point to the component repos, right? The, uh, the aircraft function, the position function, and the feeder uh, application. If you have questions, comments, or feedback, once you check that out, by the way, I would encourage you to uh, watch and uh, star the repo because repos uh, because I will be making changes as I develop this and continue to develop this. Uh, if you have questions, comments, or feedback, email is great. Uh, Twitter is better. Uh, and the Spring Boot book also has a Twitter account if you'd like to follow that and check it out. Thank you for coming. And uh, with that, I think we have like two minutes left for questions. If you have any questions, uh, fire away now. If you think of them later, by all means, don't get discouraged. Just reach out to me. I'm happy to answer them. With that, Yolan, I think uh, I think we have it. Okay. Do you want to? Uh, can you see the comments and the questions? Um, hold on. Let me let me find out. Comments. Yes. All right. Okay. So let me. Oh wow, there's a lot. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. So so let me. Uh, no, I I scroll back too far. Oh good. Okay. So that's fine. Let's let's scroll down through here. Da, 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 da. Yeah. All right. Hi, Scott. Hi, Michael. Good to, good to chat with you both. Awesome quote. Yeah. I love a good quote, right? And, and some of them just really, um, they nail it. <laughs> it is live. I'm live. I, I think I'm live. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all live and, and, uh, it's, yeah. So, and it all worked. That's a, that's a win-win. Uh, there is a repo with a full code. Absolutely. Uh, get functional. will take you to the meta repo. It just has a readme and links to, to the other. I sometimes do a, uh, uh nested repos, uh, but I find that, uh, folks sometimes get a little turned around on those. So I just put links in there this time. Uh, yeah, it is live. I just went up to that again. <laughs> uh, is it, uh, it is too fast to replay the code in IntelliJ. Yeah. So by the way, please do feel free to take pauses. 
Um, I actually will try to break things out a little bit better over time in the repos where it's easier to see the steps as we go. But I do try to just comment and not delete code as I go, just so you can reference that later on as well. Uh, and YouTube, yep, uh, get functional. Yeah, I guess should be a workshop. I'd be happy to do that sometimes. So we just need to make that happen. By the way, everything that I showed, there are many ways to, to get there from here. There are many paths. I just like to show the simplest, fastest path because I think that's a great place to start and build out from it. So if you have a question about something I did, uh, maybe I took a little bit of a shortcut, happy to explain why and maybe other ways to get it uh, done in a more uh, maybe production friendly way. I, I don't know. But there are certainly other ways to get there. Um, it's just a just a what I feel like is this the shortest path and the most comfortable path to 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 show to repeat and uh, whatnot. So I guess that's it. Let's see. I might have missed it. Are there life cycles? Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's another whole topic uh, <laughs> for another day. They're also like uh, um, in a tied in with life cycles, there are default run uh, like uh, durations and things like that. Uh, I should probably add to some of those resources to my ending helpful resources. But uh, but if anybody wants to to uh, check those out, I'll I'll look up and paste some of those into a tweet here in a little bit. So uh, check. Uh, check me out on Twitter. That's probably the easiest way. Uh, email is one to one. Twitter is kind of one to many. So uh, follow me, and we'll I'll share more later. Yes, I totally recommend um, following uh, Mark on Twitter. Very active and very responsive. It's fun. We're um, Mastodon, but I, I I find that Twitter is kind of the uh, still, and who knows, uh, but uh, but still the kind of the, the the central place for people to get together and and chat. Uh, with with hopefully a minimal amount of noise. So <laughs> that's true. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for all that content. That was wonderful. So oh, thanks for having me. Always always love to 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 hang with the gang. So <laughs> take care. Bye bye. Bye now. <laughs>